Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's nice to be together. It is remarkable how a well-known saying can lose or change its meaning over time. Consider these nursery rhymes that many of us recited to our children. Baba black sheep, have you any wool? The origin of this was a medieval wool tax imposed in the 13th century by King Edward I. Black sheep were also considered bad luck because their fleeces were unable to be dyed or less lucrative to the farmer. How much the meaning has changed to this day. How about ring around the rosy a pocket full of posy. This was a rhyme that goes back to the great plague of London to 1665. The rosy in the rhyme is the rash that developed on the skin due to the bubonic plague, the stench of which was so terrible that people would carry pockets full of posies try and blunt the smell. Or one more. Here we go round the mulberry bush. This rhyme was originated at the Wakefield Prison in England, where female inmates had to exercise around mulberry trees in the prison yard. In each of these, the original meaning of the phrase gave way to something more benign over time, to a point where parents would sit in a nursery room and sing them to their children. This morning, I want to examine one of the most famous statements in the Torah where the opposite happens. The meaning of the phrase became more ominous over time and should, I believe, still be a warning for us today. In our portion, as Jacob pointed out, Isaac planned to offer the birth blessing to Esau, but Rebekah took advantage of Isaac's sight impairment to trick him into blessing the second-born son, Jacob. Rebecca dressed her younger son in the clothing of Esau, even putting the fur of an animal on his hands and on the back of his neck, lest Jacob touch him, lest Isaac touch him. Isaac immediately detected a problem as Jacob spoke. While Jacob lied to his father, saying that he was actually Esau, Isaac remained suspicious. He declared, a kol kol Yaakov, vayadaim yidei Esav. The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands, the hands are the hands of Esau. In context, these words appear as nothing more than a benign statement of fact as Isaac tried desperately to determine who was standing before him. Esau's response to learning that his brother Jacob had deprived him of the birth blessing through guile is one of the most poignant, painful moments to be found anywhere in the Bible. The Esau of the story that we read this morning is a sympathetic figure. Jacob is the aggressor. By the time of the rabbis, though, this phrase, the voice is the voice of Jacob, the hands are the hands of Esau, had taken on a far more ominous meaning. 
Esau by that time was seen as dangerous, was seen as a murderous brute by the rabbis. And the meaning of these words, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau, took on a very different meaning. In Midrash Rabbah, it is stated that as long as the voice of Jacob's descendants remained focused on prayer and study, the violent and murderous hands of Esau could not reach them. No longer a sympathetic figure, Esau was now a murderous boor. The change in perception was due entirely to the historical circumstances of the Jewish community under the brutal rule of the Romans. Just as Esau was identified with the color red and the Edomites, so too the color of the Roman Empire was red. And so the rabbis simply believed that Rome, the Roman Empire, were the descendants of Esau. And when the whole Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire under Christendom, the rabbis believed that this was also an extension of the descendants of Esau, where their treatment became far worse. And the rabbis determined that the story of Jacob and Esau was happening before them. And those ominous hands of Esau were something to be feared. Meanwhile, the view of the Jew by the church and Protestant leaders only furthered this idea. For them, the fate of the Jew was to be a perpetual wanderer whose abuse would serve as a lesson to the entire world of the fate of those who do not accept the sacrifice of their Messiah on the cross. Jews were blamed for the crucifixion and with it the eternal crime of deicide, the murder of God. Jews were given supernatural powers as a result and were seen as the embodiment of evil. Now, of course, not every Christian saw Jews this way, nor did every priest or pastor preach against us. But the expulsion of the Jews from country after country, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the pogroms, the Chelmaninsky massacres, the blood libels, all of this creating a through line to the Holocaust spoke to the chilling nature of this narrative. For years after the liberation of the camps, it appeared that Esau was in retreat. The hands of this brute were less ominous. Overt anti-Semitism in words and deeds were no longer acceptable behavior. As we get farther and farther away from the Holocaust, as the historical memory of the death camps fade, as the years go by, the hands of Esau are reappearing. The establishment of the state of Israel and the Zionist cause, as well as the political power of Jews in this country, has created an entirely new avenue for the hands of Esau to make themselves known. Three years ago last week, Robert Bowers entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and yelled, all Jews must die, then opened fire upon the congregants. He was armed with an assault rifle and several handguns and killed 11 congregants and wounded six others, four of whom are police officers in the worst anti-Semitic act in American history. When surrendering to law enforcement, Bowers told an officer that he wanted all Jews to die and that the Jews were committing genocide against his people. He was reacting to the work of Hyas, the Hebrew immigrant, 
aid societies work to increase and settle immigrants to this country. Robert Bauer's shooting of Jews whose only crime was attending synagogue on a Shabbat morning was an American illustration of the transformed meaning of the hands of Esau. Before I go any further, we should also note that the city of Pittsburgh magnificently represented the voice of Jacob in its response to this massacre. They taught the Torah of love and caring throughout the city. From the patch on the jersey of the Pittsburgh Steelers to signs in the windows all over the city, reading love is stronger than hate, or the words of the mourners Kaddish in Aramaic in the headline of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the only time any American newspaper has done so, were extraordinary. The people of Pittsburgh represented the best of America. And as heartening as that is, as much as we should celebrate the Kol Yaakov, the voice of Jacob in this country, and in some parts of our society, we must not allow ourselves to, blind, to be blind to the hands of Esau making their hands known in this country. A year before the massacre in Pittsburgh, American neo-Nazis walked through Charlottesville carrying tiki torches, crying, Jews will not replace us a slogan based upon the canard that Jews are behind the rising number of people of color in this country and their increased rights, that Jews are a globalist threat led by George Soros and others. People around the country might have laughed at these neo-Nazis referring to them in derisive terms, but people like Robert Bowers and many, many others took note of their words. The Jews will not replace us and saw it as a call to action. Last Shabbat, we commemorated the third anniversary of the Tree of Life pogrom. And this past week, just days after, in Charlottesville, the trials taking place. Thanks to the remarkable efforts of an organization called Integrity First for America, whose leader I had the privilege of interviewing this past summer. This past week, Deborah Lipstadt was called to testify just days after that anniversary in Pittsburgh. One of our most important scholars on anti-Semitism, Lipstadt, is the person who stood up against the Holocaust denier, David Irving, and won in a British courtroom. In Charlottesville, Deborah Lipstadt was asked to again define the Holocaust. She said a state-sponsored genocide by the Hitler regime that took place between 1933 and 1945 a systematic plan to annihilate all the Jews of Europe and actually beyond as well. It didn't matter, she said, if the Jews lived inside German territory or outside. It didn't matter if they were old or tiny babies. If you were a Jew, you were to be annihilated. She was asked to define Jew hatred. You know, there are, there is a, there are Jews, and you despise them, and you want to do them harm. She was asked to define the replacement theory. She said, the theory began to gain traction in the 1960s and the 1970s, and then again in the 1990s when legislation focused on voting and civil rights were passed. She said, there were some people who were disturbed by this, and they were convinced that the people of color couldn't be doing this on their own. There had to be someone behind the scenes manipulating it all, making it happen. People of color were puppets, and the Jews were the puppeteers. 
All the while, the organizers of the neo-Nazi march were sitting in that courtroom making a mockery of the trial, representing themselves, and asking each other questions like, what's your favorite Holocaust joke? It's hard to believe that the acts of Pittsburgh and Charlottesville are part of our present, and that the reality of the Holocaust was on trial in the United States of America we are struggling with the hands of Esau in 2021, 76 years since the end of the Second World War. Dara Horn is a nationally celebrated novelist. She's a brilliant writer, and as she says, Dara Horn is the go-to person whenever there is a Jewish tragedy for newspapers like the New York Times. But after Pittsburgh, she refused to write for the newspaper. In her words, there was no way I could write about any of this for the New York Times or any other mainstream news outlet. I couldn't stomach all the, all the to-be-sures and all the verbal garbage I would have to shovel in order to express something acceptable to a non-Jewish audience in a thousand words or less. I could no longer handle the degrading exercise of calmly explaining to the public why it was not okay. Or that we should all care about it because they are serving as a warning. Because when Jews get murdered or maimed, it might be an ominous sign that actual people People who wear athleisure might later get attacked. I was alone with this sort of thing, which amounted to politely persuading people of one's right to exist. In other words, Dara Horn was no longer willing to explain the hands of Esau in our world as the work of a few demented people or teach moral lessons from the acts of abject anti-Semitism. Instead, she wrote a book of nonfiction with the uncomfortable title, People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present. Her point is that the world is comfortable mourning dead Jews, whether it be the Holocaust or the victims of Pittsburgh. It is living Jews that the world has a problem with, whether they're here in America or in the land of Israel. It's a fascinating, disturbing, and very important book. And it will be our honor to have a conversation with Dara this Thursday night on Zoom, and I hope many of you will join in the discussion. Dara Horn's book focuses on different examples of the people around the world unwilling to acknowledge the hands of Esau in our world, the uniqueness of anti-Semitism, the actual danger that Jews are living with, in short, a blindness to the real and present danger that the hands of Esau represent in our world to the living Jews. Whether it be in Pittsburgh, Amsterdam, or Harbin, China, Spoiler alert, Dara Horn offers no answers, but her ability to describe the Kafkaesque irrational reality that Jews live with and embrace the chilling irony of it all spotlights an unwillingness to acknowledge the work, to acknowledge, to ignore the work of the hands of Esau. The fact is, is that there are phrases and rhymes whose terrifying meaning has been lost to us and now serve as the stuff of nursery rhymes that we sing with our children. But there are other phrases whose meanings have become more ominous over time, and we dare not blunt their meaning. The words of a blind father who was confused by the voice of his son and the feel of his hands has reflected a different reality for his descendants over time, a terrifying image of the danger that lurks around us. Living Jews must be vigilant 
in our response to anti-Semitism and its victims. Living Jews must be quick to correct those who would prefer to ignore the uniqueness of Jew hatred. The fact that Deborah Lipstadt had to testify that the Holocaust actually occurred and explain or define anti-Semitism in America in 2021 under oath should tell you everything that you need to know about this moment in time. Ignoring the hands of Esau, not using the voice of Jacob in our day, is something that Jews do at their own peril. I ask you to rise now as we remember those who died in Pittsburgh 13 years ago. God, full of mercy, who dwells on high, 
Establish proper rest upon the wings of the divine presence on the levels of the holy and pure ones who shine like the splendor of the firmament for the souls of the Kadoshim of Pittsburgh. Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Mallinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Dan Stein, Mel Wax, and Irv Younger murdered. Al Kiddush Hashem, because we pray for the elevation of their souls and remember for us their sacrifice and let their merit stand for us. Let the earth not cover their blood and let there not be a place sufficient for their cries. Master of mercy, cover them in the cover of your wings forever and bind their souls with the binding of life. God is their inheritance. May they rest in the Garden of Eden. May they rest in peace upon their places of repose and let them stand and be remembered for all time. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Good